All right, um, I'm Greg Lasinski, and with the Information Education Subcommittee, and what I like to do is, of course, give everyone an update on what we've all been working on, and then also help to put into context what we're doing, because a lot of folks here, uh, some of the technical folks are always out there in the field thinking, working bears. A lot of the administrative folks do a lot of other things, so sometimes bears aren't the number one thing on their radar, so what I've done over the years is kind of help put into perspective what's going on as far as the public perceives what we're doing. So we'll get to that in a little bit. But first of as was mentioned earlier, um, we at the summer meeting talked about recording and the, the meeting so the public could uh, see what was going on. We had lots of requests for PowerPoint slides and there was concerns over the PowerPoint slides. So what we did is we, the ITPC voted that we would video the meetings and we experimented with that at the last YES meeting. And so this is our IGBCC website. And if you go there under the Yellowstone subcommittee, you can see video clips of the various <laughs> presentations. That's what I've got going on today here. Uh, there's a microphone, so there's also audio to go along with the presentation. And, uh, and again, it's just a, a video. So if anyone wanted to make copies of it, they technically, I guess, could. But it's not the highest quality, but it does get the information out uh, just so people understand at this last meeting we had at least two video cameras running the entire time that the, 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 the meeting was going so again what we were saying was already being copied and distributed so we were just like, like I say controlling at least officially from our end what's going on so that's what we're gonna be doing here today and again if you go to uh, YouTube it links up from our website to the Yellowstone Ecosystem Subcommittee meeting and uh, Mary gave a very good talk at the start of that meeting about the subcommittee and how it's structured, and so we have that as a lead off. And, and I think hopefully we'll get to the point where we can create something like that for IGBC as well. Um, again, part of my job is to make sure that we get the word out about our meetings, and with the help of everyone's PIOs and PAOs, we do get that out there. And of course, on our website, it gets picked up uh, all over the place. I love how people do it. If you're following Grizzly Bear Management, um, got picked up again in all the different places where people are interested in resources, they've got it out there. Uh, we even they even pick up new facts like uh, where our next chair is going to be. So again, it's interesting what the media will pick up, not just about the bears, but about who's leading it. So there's definitely an interest. And um, this just came out uh, yesterday because the interest was, was sparked a little bit by the release of the letter between the states and uh, uh, Dan Ash, and I'm sure that'll be discussed probably along the way here. But again, so lots of folks following what's happening, particularly with the Yellowstone ecosystem. One thing I, I threw this in as a point of interest is this was after the YES meeting. So this was an event that happened in the summer. The media interest went down like this. We had a meeting and it shot up again. So it shows that the folks out there are paying attention what, to what's happening at these meetings. Okay, sometimes we may think, who's following what we're doing, but there are lots of folks out there. And I thought it was very interesting that there was a big spike in, in, in the story, and Carrie's going to talk about it again, I know, uh, and it's very enlightening to see what happened from the social media in there, but again, this was months after it actually occurred that it turned into a news story again because of the Yes meeting. And again, our goal is to try to get our name out there everywhere we can, whether it's print, radio, internet, you name it trying to let folks know that there is a group like the IGBC out there and that we are trying to you know, work for grizzly bear recovery and management in the lower 48 and adjacent Canadian provinces. As far as some of the good things that happened, I can report mainly on the Yellowstone, although I did get input from some of the other states, it, and Dan's here, and, and uh, was this uh, partnership award that was, was given to GYC. And again, in our ecosystem, we have done lots of, of work uh, combining the state, federal, as well as the NGOs to try to reduce human bear conflict. And I know everyone else is doing that, and I would like to, again, encourage the members that are here to encourage their staff that when I send out an email saying I'm going to be at a presentation and I'd like to report on what you do, let me know the good things that they're doing so other folks can, can learn about it. Because there are lots of things going on out there. And one thing that we've done in Idaho, we go to Idaho Master Naturalist Program, where we use a uh, a cadre of citizen scientists and educators and they go out with their bear education trailer and talk to the public trying to help educate the public and reduce conflict. We also teach a, a course that I teach, it's a two credit college course for teachers called Wild About Bears and it's based on the whole Project Wild type of curriculum. And it's hosted at Harriman State Park which we're fortunate enough to have both black and grizzly bears at. 
And again, the point of that course is helping humans to be smarter than the average bear. And it's been very successful, and, uh, and we will keep doing it as long as we can. Um, and as part of that, we incorporate uh, something that was paid for by the IHBC a few years ago, which was a STEM-based curriculum for 9th and 12th graders, where they can actually go online, look at the data, so to speak, and then decide whether the bear should be delisted or not. And this has been a, a big hit, and we're actually going to be presenting this again at the statewide Idaho Environmental Education Conference this spring to try to get even more teachers using it. So again, if there's other agencies here that would like to know more about it, we could plug them into the folks that are that put it together, and, and, and it's a great way for high school kids to you know, get hands-on data, work, and make some decisions. And again, it's something that we're always working on. And here, this is Harriman, start of ski season, we still had bears moving around. So we're talking about educating the public as far as uh, being bear aware while they're skiing. And not many folks think about carrying bear spray during the snow sports, but I'll show you another slide here that kind of shows you never know what you're gonna run into. Uh, won't steal the thunder, but Randy's here from the Grizzly Wolf Discovery Center. Those folks there have been incredible partners and we're recognized for that, and I think that's wonderful. And I also want to thank all the different agencies that help us out getting the word uh, about what's going on with bear management. And, and I can't s state enough that the public wants to know these things. They want to know where we're going as far as with recovery, where we're at with management. They want to know when bears are being moved from one spot to another. And I applaud what Wyoming has done. And uh, I think all the member agencies need to, to do all that they can to keep the public informed. And I'll show you some examples of what can happen down the line uh, with the public and how they respond. Also, uh, you know, the North Cascades we've been talking about, and there's people, you know, good, good word getting out on that, people starting to talk about it, and so that's, that's what we want. We want there to be an interest in what's happening and start engaging the public. And I applaud all the different agencies, particularly the Park Service that's leading the efforts there. The Bitterets have come online, and, this, and uh, they supplied some of the examples of, of the kits that they're sending out. I know Chuck uh, Barlabaugh brought his trailer and helping them do outreach, and again, these one-on-one -on -one contacts have been key to getting out our message with the products that we have. And so the more of these we can do, the better we are at reaching the public and helping them understand what they can do to help with whether it's recovery or reducing conflict. One thing I'll be handing out here to any media that are uh, uh, that in attendance is I do create a little notebook for reporters so that when they have a question, they can have some quick numbers here. I'm gonna get these from Chris, so hopefully they're the ones we're gonna get out and then how, someone they can get a hold of. Because we found that if the media has a contact point, they'll come to it. If they don't, they're gonna start drifting out there and getting into who knows what kind of sources. And we all know what the internet can provide, and I'll show some of that here in a second. Um, wanna move on and, and touch base. Um, all of you, your, your agencies did submit um, requests for the IGBC grants. Um, we have a, a running total of $36,000 to give out, which is, again is not a lot in the, the INE world. Or, and, uh, and it was a tough, tough process to go through. We had more than double. We had about $80,000 worth of requests. And, and, and we, what we ended up doing is working through, based on the priorities of the, the different ecosystems that submitted them, as well as going through and looking at what was the project. Was it something new? Was it trying to, 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 to engage the public or was it just trying to help pay for a position that had been there for years and again a lot of these are good positions that have been there for a long time but probably to the point where when you only have thirty six thousand dollars to work with you need to kind of keep spreading it and getting more people involved so uh, again these were the the, uh, the the awards that went out and again the details are, are available if you want them we'll have them i'm sure uh, we've got this online yeah. And so I uh, won't spend a lot of time, but just know that there's lots and lots of good requests and there's no way we can meet all of them. And because of that, we have this list here of the unfunded. And so if you see your agency up there and you see an unfunded amount, know that that was a great program probably, but we just didn't have the money. And that's just how it went. And so if IGBC ever wants to increase the amount of money available, that's wonderful. Or I know within the state sometimes we can find that money. So I would encourage you again, if you see something that your agency had that wasn't funded, and you can work to, to try to, to find something. And again, we're not talking huge amounts of money. Uh, these are always partnerships with other projects and other organizations even. But again, we just could not fund them all. So 
this is that list again of, uh, of those that could not be funded. It was, again, more than the amount that we actually gave away. So yeah, again, it's great that there's interest, but we hate to, to say no. And again, there's lots of good things going on there, and it's, it's getting out to the media, to the public, and, and that's what we want. Uh, you know, this story here just came out, and it's in relation to the Yellowstone as far as the lake trout and the role that they play with the grizzlies. So again, there's an interest out there, and if we can provide, you know, all the good things we're doing, uh, it, it will get picked up, and that's the good part about it, because we, we need to get out our successes of all the different partners that are out there putting, putting things out to the media. And again, people are seeing this over and over, and we've got studies out there now uh, presented at the Yellowstone meeting about the genetic diversity and how that affects the concepts like linkage. And so we've got good news, we need to be, help spread it. And so again, I would encourage all, all the managers here to try to cut free their people as much as they can to, to help with any kind of getting out the word about good things that are happening. And again, it may seem mundane to us, but to the public, knowing that people are working on bears, whether it's managing or relocating or reducing conflict, those are stories that, uh, that the public wants to hear if we provide it. And again, once the, the story takes off, it really, it, um, it, human interest grows. And uh, we had this story here that, uh, you know, people are like, you know, oh, it's horrible, you put this bear down, he's just getting it home, it wasn't hurting anybody, until we could show why the bear was doing what he did. Okay, he run out of teeth. And he was resorting to using the, the other tools or knowledge that he had. And when he started to read the post, it's always fun to read the comments after a story, the public kind of understood what was going on. That, hey, you know, this, there was a reason why Fishing Game did this, and so that's what we need to do is work with the public, work with the media to get out these messages of why we're, and how we're managing these bears. Um, this story here is, is uh, not just with, with Yellowstone, but relates to uh, Northern Colony Divide ecosystem as well. And I'm, I'm quoted there just saying, you know, we have limited space for these bears. We can move bears, but that's not the answer. And at times there's going to be management that has to be done. And, and the public, again, I think if we talk to them about that, they seem to understand it and understand that it's not just Yellowstone, it's, it's any place where we, we've got a success story happening like the Northern, or Northern Continental Divide ecosystem too. And again, if the public understands what's happening, they generally be on our side as far as how we do our management. Uh, we've got some late, late season things here that we're still trying to, to figure out, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, this is a story that I know Carrie's going to talk about, and it did spin off some other discussions out there. And again, there's a lot of discussions about bears out there, and it, what, we need to engage the public. And it's not just like, say, in the Yellowstone, but Northern Colorado Divide and Selkirk. So we've got bears that are expanding, the recovery is doing well. And because of that, we as humans need to make decisions on how we're going to work to try to, to, to fit with the bears. And so again, these kind of stories become not just for one ecosystem, but for all ecosystems. And so we need to work on some of our messaging there as far as uh, alerting the public and seeing what we can do to reduce these kind of conflicts. And again, we did have some conflicts start. Uh, this is uh, Carrie's picture here that they loved of the bear and the tree there. But again, it's what we started to see in all the different ecosystems that we had bears uh, looking out, bears getting into chickens. Okay, uh, again, the public's like, you know, that's, they never heard of that. Well, yeah, it happens. Um, we had, situation where we had a bear that was uh, saw with cubs getting into, or, uh, uh, getting into orchards with apples. So we, we tracked that bear. We ended up putting her down, but there was a lot of interest in what was gonna happen to the bear, or the cubs. So we did end up releasing the cubs with radio collars and they have stayed out of trouble, and that's a good story for now. So again, letting the public know what we're doing, and even, this is the Bridger Teton, just last week extended their, their food storage orders into the hunting season because there's hunters out there and there's still bears out there. And again, the public wasn't really thinking bears, but at least the folks at the BT were in trying to work with getting the word out so that people would be as smart as they could. So again, lots of good things that are being done by all the partners to help reduce conflict. And again, it's just little snippets from the internet of all kinds of different things that we're working on. Uh, and again, it's not always about grizzly bears, in this case, that was a black bear, if you've seen the video, that bear running around in the school or something. But again, we're trying to, to educate the public about the different types of bears we have and what we can do as humans to reduce those conflicts. 
And again, everyone is starting to realize that, yeah, we got a lot of bears, and particularly in the Yellowstone ecosystem. And so there's lots of discussion out there. And for the most part, the scientific community is saying, yeah, we've, we're at capacity. We've got lots of bears. All the way down to the county saying, yeah, we've got lots of bears. We need to do something about it. And again, so now we're coming to this point where people are looking for, for some movement. Lots of stories. And because of the success we're having, you know, we're starting to get stories like this, where, yeah, we need to do something. We need to manage bears. We can only move them so far. Sometimes it's an answer. We can do some certain things to reduce conflict. Other times, you do have to remove an animal. And again, we still have situations like poaching occurring. It hasn't gone away. All across the ecosystems, we have bears that just appear dead. So this one I like to bring up because this happened this earlier this fall in Idaho. This individual was uh, had an interaction with, the, with this sow, and while she was chewing on his left hand, he couldn't get to his bear spray here. He did have a revolver, 44 here. Started shooting point blank five rounds on the bear. And as it turns out, that bear did have a collar on it. The bear was there, that bear is still alive. So either he totally missed the bear at point blank range, or the bear took five shots at point blank range and is still alive. So again, lots of, of lessons to be learned there about how sure you can be about you know, a handgun and what it can do versus bear spray. And again, the fellow did a bear spray, he just couldn't get to it. And uh, this was a story that was great. Uh, I don't, we're not recommending that to anyone that if they have a problem with bear that they shove their arm down their throat, but that again did get picked up in the media. And uh, what was really neat was though, after these kind of incidents occurred, was on Facebook, up in Ashton, Idaho, we had people there posting links to our website to, to the video about demonstrations on using bear spray. So that's what we want, is the public spreading our message for us, not just the agencies. And in this case, it, it's, it's great to have people going to the website because they were told to by someone in their community. And so for the most part, we're getting some good, good PR on, on, on use of bear spray. Although there are some situations where, I know we're still in an investigation where people say they used it and it didn't work, and it, hopefully we can learn more about that and try to address that. But it, again, there's, there's more and more thought out there into bear spray. Even this company now is packaging inert training spray with the, the, the actual spray so people can try it. And again, anything that we can do to get people thinking about bear spray and about carrying it is important. And there's still the never ending discussion about guns. But again, we're trying to let folks know that bear spray is a, is a far more effective tool for most instances for people. And even recently, too, now for hunters now in Wyoming, uh, they had to, in the park, they had to close in, in Teton an area because of bear activity. So again, lots of good management going on to make sure that we can have people and bears in the same area doing their thing. And this is one of those stories I said I'd mention. I don't know if anybody saw this about carrying your bear spray in the winter. Uh, I don't know the story. Maybe Tony knows or someone from Canada. But uh, some fellow folks climbing actually ran into a grizzly bear while ice climbing. Pretty much something you wouldn't expect. As far as other things you wouldn't expect, this story made the news last week. I don't know if any folks saw this. Um, and uh, luckily, it turned out it was not true. Uh, although I'm sure it would have helped the movie sales. But one thing that is interesting that came out of it were follow-up stories like this that started talking about bears. And so it's, if you followed uh, the internet and spikes on, and hits and things, there was lots of interest in the sexual activity of bears, thanks to that story. So maybe that creates interest for the public that way. It's an education of sorts. Uh, Quick note here, I, folks know I've been doing work over, over in Europe, and over there they have similar problems. If you translate that, it's something about attacking bear, hunters, ogre, you know. Uh, Google Translator doesn't work very well. But, uh, so you can see the universal problems that we have. In this uh, story here, the folks there are convinced that the radio collars strangle the bears, and that's why we can't put radio collars on the bears. So again, uh, all kinds of interesting things people think about. One problem that we have not had here yet 
is that over in uh, Europe, a big tradition uh, is, instead of Halloween is uh, a day where they all go to the cemetery and hang out and party and talk about ancestors. Well, the problem is these candles have oils in them and track bears. So I don't think anybody here yet has had the problem of grizzly bears getting into cemeteries to get the candles that were left behind. But again, interesting things happening there. And uh, just a side note, a lot of the work that we do here, I get to talk about over there, and the folks may know or not, that I did receive a, a Fulbright uh, for next fall to go to Slovakia to, to spread the word of what we're doing here, as well as teach Project Wild to the university teachers there. And again, we need to keep teaching and talking about management. There's folks out there that really don't understand that management has lots of tools in the box and that hunting is one of those tools. And it's being tied into now with mountain lions or even Cecil. And again, as we start to move through the Yellowstone process again, there's people out there saying, no, you can't, you can't um, hunt the bears. And there's even very specific bears that are being focused on, something we try not to do, and, but yet they're being plugged into the story of, of delisting and recovery. And, uh, and so that you can see this is what the public is thinking and seeing now. And so we need to help educate against that to under, so folks can understand why we do and what we do. Because it is all being linked together. And it's not just here, it's up in Canada too. It's, it's a universal kind of thing of folks about a relationship with bears. And again, we've got folks out there that are really capitalizing that, on that, putting out the story. And you know, we've got uh, some big names like Ted Turner or Mangelson or even Jane Goodall that are saying, can't hunt the bears. So again, we've got a challenge here to try to educate people about the tools that we have and why we have to use them. There's again, lots of things out there that have to do about how a bear is only worth money to a camera not to be hunted. But, and, and so the discussions we have about bears and limits and hunting are all things that the public wants to know about. So we need to, to work with them. One other topic that we all know about was the, the concern by the tribes over certain aspects of the delisting. And again, their, their, their concerns from a spiritual or cultural perspective are, are legitimate, and, and I know we're, we're working to meet them, but also there's folks out there that are orchestrating conflict. And we watched this happen at the last spring meeting in Cody, or two years ago, where it was a conflict that was now posted, was created, it was not, it was not done intentionally by us, but it was done intentionally by a party there to try to foment concern about the way that we are treating the issue and, and our folks are doing the best they can. And, and so again, know that there's people out there doing this. And I did not call this person a witch, um, <laughs> but she did call herself. And, um, and so I thought it was interesting that the approach that was, was, was being used here was that good witch, bad witch. And so, uh, the way I look at it, it's more like good science, bad science, okay? And you know, folks out there just talking about, and again, not a big pool of folks, a small pool of folks, but very good at getting the word out, about how our numbers aren't good, okay? How our counting methods aren't suitable or reliable. I mean, show me a population that's had more work done on than the Yellowstone. So again, we need to counteract this kind of message that's out there. Okay. I don't believe we, our count is flexible fiction. Yet there's folks out there who are trying to promote that. Or that still the donut hole theory, that the core is dead. Okay. So again, we've got lots of work to do, but we've come a long way. And I'm glad to be a part of the effort that we've got going on here. And again, I would encourage everyone to to allow their folks to engage as much as they can in the, in the INE section. I know it's tough, uh, lots of other things happening, but especially in, in ecosystems where things are happening, we need to be getting the word out. And we need to have the INE folks be engaged so that they understand what's happening, so that they can always get to the media or refer the media to the right people. Again, it's, it's a matter of getting our message out, because if we don't do it, someone else will. Any questions about anything that sh showed up there? Scott? Greg, you mentioned it briefly, the uh, uh, articles that came out recently about uh, hunter interactions with bears and, and bear spray. A couple articles I read in the media uh, reference 
I tried beer spray, it didn't work, then I shut it. Right. And, and I know there's some backstories to that, maybe some of are still coming um, and, and, and some good reasons that are being found out for that. But I don't know if the other side of that story, the follow-up is getting out relative to that, what those reasons were, why the bear spray didn't work. Yeah, and those are, no, I don't, those are cases that are under investigation. And that's all I, I mean, when I try to run them down to do exactly what you're suggesting, um, I couldn't find any information. And so again, as soon as we find something out, we definitely need to get the word out to, to counteract that because we have done, a, I think, a really good job of trying to educate the public. And whenever you get a story like that, it, it kind of takes it off a bit. So I'm trying to find out the details on that. There were two, one being two incidents that happened in Montana. Yep. They are under investigation, and then the rest of the story comes out to circulate that. Yep. So Wyoming didn't have any, all this piece of air spray in Wyoming was successful. So it's questionable what happened here and when we find the rest of the story we're going to have it. So it, it, and one thing and that I will say is that we have found, particularly in Idaho, where we can get on a case and, and move through it quickly. Whatever the outcome is, the public seems to understand it and, and be fairly good with it. It's when cases get tied up, I'm not pointing fingers at any federal type agency, but the more layers and time that get involved, the more the message kind of gets lost. And then we've got a problem that the public is waiting for two years to find out about something. And that's, in the internet society we live in today, it doesn't work that way. You know, we need to be thorough and, uh, and, and do a, a good job of, of investigating, but we need to make decisions quickly because, uh, again, that's what the public expects. And, uh, and again, we've got some cases that are over two years old that haven't been resolved. And, and again, the public is constantly is asking about those cases. And so, again, do it, spread the word and get those done as much as we can. Great bit. Um, one of the common themes is, you know, potential for hunt, and we've talked about that around this table before. Uh, I just want to give you a heads up about uh, a flag that's hit BC to the point of almost immobility for our agency in the last couple of weeks, and it's all related to orphan black bear cubs. But we did have the case with the Yellowstone cubs uh, potentially coming to British Columbia. I, I just unbelievable amount of public interest and public pressure when they're little. I mean, they're always interesting, they're always capturing the public attention, but when they're cubs, it's astonishing and how political that will go, how fast that will go political. Yeah. It's my heads up to you guys. And I think Kerry will share some information in his talk about the ramifications that can occur when you do what you know needs to be done. That not, uh, what I'm going to do now is turn it over to, to Colleen Matt uh, 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 for WMI, and they're again the folks that we've contracted with, and she's going to explain about what they do. And again, given the state of 